song that is the lily of the valley amen very good song all right let's take our bibles and let's open our bibles to the book of jeremiah jeremiah chapter 29 jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 8 jeremiah 29 and verse 8 i have been doing a series of messages about how to make 2021 better than 2020. I'm going to take a break from that series. Lord willing, we'll get back into it next week. And I have another message that I want to preach today about our country. We had a new president take over, take the office this past week. If you didn't know that, welcome to America. Welcome to our world. I'm sure everybody knew all of that already. But anyway, a new administration has taken over. And so here is the title of my message today. I'll give it to you right away. And this is the thought process that I have going into this message. And that is how to pray for America. How to pray for America. Look at Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 8. Let's all stand as I read this verse from the Bible. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 8. For thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams, which ye cause to be dreamed. For they falsely prophesy unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to listen to your word. Help us not to be led astray by ideas or philosophies that might sound good. Lord, help us not to be led astray by our own ideas or philosophies that might lead us astray. Lord, help us to, as we talked about in Sunday school, receive your word with meekness. Bless and help us. Help us to know how to pray for this country. Give us wisdom. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Go back to verse number one, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse one. The Bible says, now these are the words of the Lord, or the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders, which were carried away captives, and to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. All right, so that verse is fairly self-explanatory as to what is taking place. So if you're wondering what's going on here, we'll just reread verse number one until it makes sense to you there. But Jeremiah is sending a letter to all these people, this group of people, these leaders over there, including the prophets. He's sending a letter to them that are in Babylon, giving them instruction. Verse two, he says after that, Jeconiah, the king and queen, the queen and the eunuchs, the prince of Judah and Jerusalem, and the carpenters and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem by the hand of El Asa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of um, Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent into Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto whom all that are unto all that are carried away captives whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Now, let me make sure you're with me on this. God allowed this to happen. This was not a, oh man, if we would have uh, put some more money into our military, we could have stopped this. This was not a, uh, uh, it's your fault. Uh, you know, I mean, it was the whole nation because of years of sin. But understand this, this was, God allowed this to happen. So we've got to come to this realization and understanding in our own life that 
the things that happen happen because God allowed them to happen. And we cannot allow our hearts to get bitter just because things did not happen the way we wanted them to happen. And we've got to realize that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord as rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. And there's many verses like that that we could look at in the Bible that just for the sake of time, we're not, I've got a lot of verses I want us to look at today. But there's many verses like that that help us to understand the situation in which we find ourselves that help us to make sense of this chaos that's going on around us. Help us to make sense of this world in which we live because it doesn't make sense. And so we have got to be grounded upon the foundation of the word of God and we've got to believe and understand that God is still in control. Well, I don't have all the answers, but I know this. He is still in control. I don't know if you read, if you do read the creation moments this past week, I read one that was amazing. Again, they all are. I like them. They're good. But this one was really good. It talked about something that's not talked a lot about of people that talk about global warming and the sea levels rising. And they all focus on the glaciers up north and say, oh, we've got to be careful because they're, they're going to melt and the sea levels are going to rise. Well, there was a creation moment this past week that talked about erosion. And as the land erodes, guess what happened? The water rises. That makes common sense. Well, they have figured it out. They've done the math on it of the current rates of erosion and how many years would it take for then our earth to be completely underwater? Just that in and of itself says our earth is not millions and billions of years old because our earth would already be underwater just because of erosion. And I don't remember the exact how many years that it would take for our earth to be totally underwater, but God knows now again, they did the math and tried to figure it out, but God knows how long it's going to take. God knows when he created this world, there was an expiration date on it. When you go buy a gallon of milk, there's an expiration date on it. You go buy a pack of bologna, and there's an expiration date on it. God put an expiration date on this earth, and it's not millions and billions of years old. And their own math will tell them, hey, wait a minute, just at the rate of erosion, it's just going to be a matter of time before this earth is completely underwater. And it makes great sense as well of explaining the flood and how the fountains of the deep were broken up. And can you just imagine this earth melting? And, and can you just imagine all this and the water level rises until everything is completely covered? When you start thinking of it in that way, you really begin to think, wait a minute, this is very easy can happen. And then God began causing the water to return, which brought the land back up. To the, to the levels in which we find it now. And gradually there's still erosion. And if you've ever thrown a rock into water, you know that rock sinks. And the same with dirt, it sinks and it causes that water level to keep rising. And so don't get alarmed and worried by all the chicken littles running around out there talking about the global warming and the ice melt. Hey, listen, it's eventually all gonna be underwater anyway. But of course we know it's eventually going to melt with a fervent heat. God is going to destroy this, but God has made a new heaven and a new earth. And so here's the thing we've got to know and understand. God is in control of everything. And God knows how close we are to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And God has to work in the hearts of the world leaders to bring about what we read in the book of Revelation. God has a will and a plan that's much bigger than our 401k or our plans and ideas for the future. God has a will that's much bigger than what we have in front of us. And even though we see these things and it, uh, it discourages us and we, we uh, hate to see these things and we're disappointed in what's happening to our country and we want to give to our kids the kind of country in which we grew up, uh, it, it's sad and our hearts break, but yet we've got to be reminded God's in control. Um, within the first 48 hours, I'm sure you heard this, 
I heard this on the news. Within the first 48 hours, 25 executive orders were signed. 25. One of them basically kills girls sports. They'll still have girls sports and show up, but he signed an executive order for boys to be able to participate in girls sports. As long as a boy is willing to then say, I'm a girl. And they'll be able to go into locker rooms and all this other stuff. And there's going to be a lot of them just say, I'm done with girls sports. And it'll take a while. It may take even longer for it to reach up here to, to Spearman, but there's eventually, there's going to be doing, there, it's going to come here. And there's just going to be a, well, I don't know what we can do about it. That's, it's just, it's happening. And you want to be able to give to your generation what you had there and say, look, my, my daughters and I, even a you know, girl say I played in sports and that. And then now it's just different. It, it's, it's different the way our country is. And we see so many things where it's just, different and um, it grieves us and so we need to know how do we pray for America what do we do with our country we got to understand as I emphasize this again God is still in control and so God is writing to the or, I mean, he's having Jeremiah to write to the captives that have been carried off into captivity uh, even though we don't like the way things have turned out, we're still living in America. I haven't been carried off captive into Mexico yet. I haven't been carried off captive to the Canada yet. I haven't been carried off captive to the Philippines yet. I haven't been carried off captive to China yet. Hey Amen. I still get to live right here in America. I don't like the way things have gone, but thank God I'm still here. Jeremiah's writing to people that have been carried captive into another country. You talk about discouraged. You imagine what those people were like as they were carried off into captivity. Well, let me continue on. Here's what Jeremiah says to them in verse number five. Build ye houses and dwell in them and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Now, let me say this also before I go on. America is not the nation of Israel. And preachers make a mistake when they take promises for Israel and try to apply them to our country. We're not God's people. Now, as a believer in Jesus Christ, I become a part of the family of God. And so there are promises that I can see where God has given to his people that I can then say, hey, that'll work for me if I'll do what God has promised in his word, what God has said to do. I can see where that promise would apply to me. But understand this, I am not a part of God's chosen people. And our country is not the nation of God. And so we cannot just take exactly from the Bible. And there's, again, there's a lot of, you got to be careful with this. This is where I'm going with this here, where Jeremiah warns of what the prophets were going to be saying. And I'm going to warn you as well, of, be careful of what you're listening to on TV or the radio or whatever, of people telling you of things of America. Be careful of that. And they use the promises that God had given to Joshua or that God had given to Moses or that God had given to uh, of Jeremiah. Be careful of people using those promises and saying, and that's for us. No, no, no. We're not Israel. We're not in Babylon. Uh, be careful of those things. You're going to deceive people and lead them astray. But yet there are principles we can't apply. He tells me, he says, when you're there in Babylon, go and build you a house. He says, go ahead and live in them. Don't just rent them out. Don't build a place and then rent it out. And then you're out in a tent somewhere and you're saying, in any minute, we're going back to Israel. And he said, no, 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 don't, don't. He said, you go ahead and live in it. And he said, not only that, he said, go ahead and plant you a garden. He said, go ahead and eat from it as well. Don't, don't grow it and then sell it and say, I'm going back to Israel anytime. No, 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 you better, you better can. You better start planning for the future. You know that the, the fruit and all that that you've grown is just going to be there for a little while. You better, you better can. You better preserve some things. You better uh, uh, make plans for the future. You're not going anywhere. You better uh, 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 settle in. And, and by the way, I, I tell each one of us, we've got to, we got to keep living. Even though we don't like something, we got to keep living. We got to keep going on. We got to keep going to work. We got to keep doing the things we're, we just can't sit in a room and cry. And I don't like this. Or I don't like that. We got to keep going and we've got to adjust where things would be necessary to adjust. But we've got to keep living. 
He says in verse 6, Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters. Hey, we, we got to keep living. We got we to keep living. This is what he's telling him. He says, you're there in Babylon, but he says, go ahead and get married. Don't say, oh, I'm not getting married because I'm going back to Israel soon. I just believe we're going. He says, no, you're not do that. Get married. Have kids. Hey, there's a lot of people that are afraid to bring children into this world right now. Listen, yes, there's a lot of fears, but we've got to keep living. We've got to keep going on with our life because we don't know when it is that Jesus is coming again. We've got, we got to keep going on with our lives. He says, take your wives. Beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters that ye may be increased there and not diminished and seek the peace of the city whether I've caused you to be carried away captives and pray unto the Lord for it for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. I need to pray for the peace of, of Spearman. I need to seek the peace of Spearman. I need to try to do all that I can to see that Spearman is a peaceful place. He said, because when this city is at peace, then I'll be able to be at peace as well. Verse 8, he says, for thus saith the Lord God of hosts, and this is our, our God of Israel, this is our text verse, let not your prophets and your diviners or diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. So he warns of two, be careful of the prophets, the outside influencers, and then he says, and be careful of your own heart. Be careful of your own dreams and your own opinions and your own ideas. He says, verse 9, he says, for they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you, excuse me, to return into this place. He says, verse 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. We've heard verse 11 a lot. If you go to a Christian bookstore, you'll find verse 11 somewhere in that Christian bookstore. There'll be a plaque hanging on the wall. There'll be something that you can get. You'll find verse 11 of the thoughts God has toward you, thoughts of peace and to give you an expected end and all that. You got to understand the context in which Jeremiah is writing that. And he says the expected end isn't yet for 70 years. Now, be honest with ourselves about our country. I don't know when things will turn around, if they ever will. If they ever will. I was just a little bitty munchkin whenever Roe versus Wade was passed. And I'm sure there were a lot of people back then that kept thinking, it'll get overturned. It'll get overturned. It's still talked about. Oh, we can, oh, we can do it. We can do it. And we were so close. I will tell you that we were so close in November. And the left was freaking out because they knew how close it was. President Trump had been able to put in a conservative Supreme Court. We could get President Trump back into there who is pro-life. And we could get other pro-lifers into Congress and into the Senate. And they could pass laws and the Supreme Court would stand there and say, yes, it's constitutional. And we were so close. And for whatever reason, God said no. We don't know when it's ever going to, uh, when it will turn or when it will ever turn. We were so close on so many things of being able to put an end to it. And now it's just gotten worse. Just gone, in 48 hours, I mean, just so many things just gone. So many things changed in our country. And I don't need to go over all of the things. You know them very well. And when's it gonna change? I don't know. Is it gonna change in four years? Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of things we've been praying about and thinking about for 40 plus years. It still hasn't changed. Um, but we do know this for us that are saved we do have an expected end we know that when our life here is over we're going to heaven we do have an expected end we know there is going to be a rapture that Jesus is coming again and we're going to be taken out we, don't, we do have an expected end we don't know the end of our country but we know for us because we are a part of the family of God we know what our expected end is is going to be. Amen. He says in verse number 12, he says, then shall ye call upon me and ye shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and ye shall seek my face and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. See, but God said, that's not till the 70 years are over. 
That's not until the seventy years are over. Now it doesn't mean between now and then we don't have to seek God. No, seek, keep seeking God. Keep that to train the future generations of this very promise as well. Keep teaching them to seek God, and then at the end of seventy years, you seek the Lord. He'll be found of you. But we've got to keep teaching the future generations of seeking the Lord. Even though others around quit seeking God, we've got to keep seeking the Lord. We've got to keep trusting him because he is coming again. And then he says in verse number 14, And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place which I have caused you to be carried away captive. Now, I'm going to stop with reading that. You can read more of it later on of what God had promised there to Israel. Um, but God has promised he's coming again, and we will be forever with the Lord. Amen. We understand our expected end as believers, but we've got to be able to separate God's promises with Israel of what God has then also promised us and we've got to be able to look at our country objectively. The problem that we have, I know that because the Lord's been working on my heart about this, I have a hard time looking at my country objectively. I like to look at my country as the greatest that there's ever been. That's the way I like to look at my country. And I believe we can see some things of where we have been the greatest that there has ever been. I believe that our country has done more in getting the gospel around the world than any country ever has in the history of the world. I do believe that. I do believe there are things where we can look at and we can say that America has been great and America was blessed by God. But let me ask you this. Do you think God is going to bless a country with so many aborted babies? Do you think that we ought to be proud of a country that has so much blood upon their hands? Do you think God is going to bless our country that is so perverted? We live in a perverted society. Do you think God is going to bless a country that is welcoming and running towards and promoting socialism? And when I'm talking about socialism, I'm not just talking about the way taxes are collected and the way money is redistributed. You've got to understand with socialism comes atheism. With socialism comes a godless society. You look at the socialist countries around the world, they are godless societies. That's the real danger that comes in with socialism. You think God's going to bless a country that is promoting socialism? Should we be proud of a country that promotes socialism? Should we be proud of a country that teaches socialism to their kids in high school and in, in college universities? Should we be proud of a country like this? Be proud of, uh, you think God is going to bless a country that is so much into environmentalism? And what is that? That's from Romans 1 of where they worship and serve the creature more than the creator. And you got to understand with, with environmentalism that comes from evolution. And what is evolution? Denying that there's a God. Denying there was a God that created everything. Do you think God's going to bless a country that teaches evolution in their schools and in their universities and won't even allow creation and God's version of a story to be taught? Should we be proud of a nation that will not even allow God's version of events of how things happen to be taught? Should we be proud of a nation like that? You think God's going to bless a nation with so much drugs and alcohol in it? Should we be proud of a nation that is like that? Should we be proud of Oregon and how they're just letting you do whatever with drugs? I mentioned this on Wednesday night about our culture and how things become culturally acceptable. There was a time years ago you would never have even imagined a pastor going to someone's home and sitting down with them and then opening a beer and drinking a beer with somebody. But that happens a lot today. Social drinking, there's a lot of pastors that have no problem with drinking beer or wine with people. And so I said this, well, if you just watch, there's gonna be a time where pastors will smoke pot with people. It'll be, it'll be here. Pastors go over and visit and somebody say, hey, you wanna, whatever they call it, a hip, you wanna joint, you wanna whatever? Pastor, yeah. Pastor talk about, oh yeah, we were sitting there smoking pot, just chilling, just talking about how good God is. That's where our country is headed. That's the direction in which we're going. You think God is going to bless a nation like that? You think we should be proud of a country like that? How about crime? So much corruption. How about entertainment? Do you think God looks down from heaven and sees the entertainment that we have in our country? And God says, now that's a nation that I want to bless. 
Wow, listen to the words of that song. Wow, that is such an uplifting song. Man, I want to bless a nation that sings like that. And that's, that person sells millions of, of that song on whatever uh, um, download that people have to be able to get their music. Wow, I want to bless a nation like that. Do you think God looks down and he sees the movies and he sees all of the other things that God says? Yes, I want to bless a nation like that. And should we be proud of a nation like that? No respect for parents. And there's several verses I have about that as well. God warns the way that is. And you look at our country and the lack of respect for parents. And that then brings me to the Ten Commandments. And you start going through the Ten Commandments. And when you have a nation that breaks the Ten Commandments, you think God's going to bless that nation? Should we be proud of a nation that does not listen to the Ten Commandments, doesn't follow the Ten Commandments? Very first session of the new Congress. Nancy Pelosi had some guy get up there that some kind of a lay preacher, whatever his deal is there. And he gave the opening prayer for the session of Congress. And he, at the end of his prayer said, a man or a woman. And everybody got all upset about, look at this, a man or a woman. Oh, uh, did you hear what he said just before he said a man or a woman? He said, we ask all of this in the name of Brahma. And he's not talking about the boots that Walmart sells. And he's not talking about a bull somewhere. That's a Hindu deity, a Hindu God. And the guy that opens up the prayer for the session of Congress asked this in the name of Brahma. And then he said, amen or a woman so that all the Christians would be distracted by that and not listen to it. We've got a country where they call our government called upon a false God. You think God's going to bless that? Should we be proud of a country like that? We think in our country that we can just put anybody in an office regardless of their qualifications, but based on their color of skin or their gender. Yeah, they tried that in the NFL. They tried that of just, oh, anybody can be the quarterback. Yeah, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. There's certain people that are actually gifted in certain areas and we ought to find the best people for the job, not just put somebody there because we need the first this or the first that. I read a thing this past week and it said, here's Kamala Harris, the very first woman to ever be elected vice president of our country and she can't even claim it because this administration does not recognize gender. Listen, you can't just put anybody in the cockpit of a plane and expect it to get where it's going. And it's the same with our country. We think we just elect some guy with dementia and think everything's going to be okay. It's not. We think we could just put a person here and put a person there and everything. It's not. I'm telling you, our country is facing some tough times ahead of us because of who we're putting in these positions. Another analogy from football. Our country is about to become the Dallas Cowboys. What do you mean by that? Well, let me take you back. You kids won't know this, but there was a time when Dallas was actually good. There was a time, you won't even understand this or believe this, but there was a time when Dallas won three Super Bowls. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. They had a coach named Jimmy Johnson. And Jimmy Johnson was very tough. Let me just put it that way. He was very, let me put it another way, he was very Trumpian. And Jimmy Johnson said, it's my way or it's the highway. And Jimmy Johnson came in and he took over a franchise that had had a very nice, respectable man, wore a fedora as the coach forever. And he was a very nice man, but... He couldn't get it done. It had passed him up. And Jimmy Johnson took over the Dallas Cowboys, and in just a short amount of time, they won a Super Bowl. They won it again. And then the owner said, I don't like all the credit he's getting. I can do this. And he thought I can just put anybody in and the job will get done. And so he fires the best coach they've ever had. And then he brings in an old retired guy that used to coach at OU. And the old retired guy was 
kind of like the new president now. There's a lot of people who just kind of like him. And he was just a good old boy, and they had such a good team, they managed to win the Super Bowl again. But that was because of what the first guy had already set into place. Listen, our country might still do good for a little bit because of what the Jimmy Johnson that we just had set into place. But let me ask you, since then, what have the Dallas Cowboys looked like? This is where we're headed with our country as well. People have got to realize you, it is very important of who that you elect. You've got to make sure that they're qualified and the people that get appointed to positions, you've got to make sure that they're actually capable of, of doing their jobs. And when Donald Trump would see somebody not doing their job, he would get a replacement. Just like how Jimmy Johnson, he had no qualms of saying, you're out of here, I'm getting somebody in that'll get the job done. In our country, we want to be the greatest, but it's sad to say the direction we can see it is we're headed down. And again, I'm concerned as a preacher, I'm head, I'm concerned about us spiritually there. Because of this past year with COVID, there's a lot of people that have lost their zeal for God. They used to be faithful in church and now they were just staying at home and tuning in and, and watching it online. And they were watching the four sermons that I would preach a week online. And then it gets, and again, I don't know who all's watching what and doing things, but I'm just saying, I know this is human nature. And you go from watching them online to where the, then it's just one a week. And then it's just one a month. And then you can't even remember when the last time was that you tuned in and listen to a message and then we got a problem that's taking place in our country right now we're getting away from God now what can we do let me give this to you how do we pray for our country number one pray for people to get saved look at Romans chapter 9 and verse 3 Romans chapter 9 and verse 3 Paul said for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul was so concerned about his nation. By the way, Jesus did not teach us to pray for our, our nation. He taught us of praying for uh, uh, people, individuals. The same for the apostles. You don't read it where the apostles would pray for revival in a, in a country. They would concentrate on the people. Then when you reach the people, then the city would have revival. We've, in our country, gotten mistaken of where we then just pray for America like there's going to be some miracle thing just come down. We've got to begin focusing on individual people. And as we reach people, our neighbors and our family, as we reach them, then revival can break out. But we can't just expect it just to fall down from heaven like rain upon us there. We've got to uh, reach people. And when God sees what we're doing and the seeds have been planted, then yes, God can send the rain that would cause it to grow. But we've got to pray for people to get saved. And with that same thought in mind of Paul saying, I wish myself a curse. In other words, he wished they could be saved. Look over to chapter 10. He's talking about it. And then look to chapter 10 now, Romans chapter 10, verse 1. He says, brethren... My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. We need to pray for people to get saved. That's what we need to be praying about. We're not praying that interest rates will stay low. Not praying that oil prices will stay low and gas prices will stay low. Not praying that a, another $600 will show up in my bank account. Not praying for, you know, some of the things that Americans get so consumed about. Hey, why don't we pray that people will get saved? That's how we pray for our country is pray that people will get saved. There's more that can be said. Let me move on quickly because I want to give these to you quickly here and wrap this up here. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Here's the second thing of how to pray for our country. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 2. He says in verse 1, I exhort therefore, 1 Timothy 2, 1, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Verse 2, 1 Timothy 2, 2, he says for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet, peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved 
and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. We need to pray. This is number two. We need to pray for those in authority. We need to, number one, pray for people to get saved. Number two, we need to pray for those in authority. Pray that the president would get saved. Pray that the vice president would get saved. And if they will not get saved, pray then that God would change their heart. But here's another thing. We also can pray that God would destroy them. And I will show you some verses on that as well. God, if they're not going to get saved, if they're not going to listen, you're not going to change their heart. Destroy them. Remove them. Again, I'm not encouraging any kind of violence. We might very well, those of us, we've never gone through a president dying in office. Years ago it happened. I came really close when I was a boy and President Reagan got assassinated. All right, some of you will remember, or not assassinated, but he got shot as an assassination attempt. Some of you will remember JFK. Some of you might remember that and you've lived through that and know what it's like of having a president die in office. Some of, we're getting to that. We might very well have a president die in office and just because of old, old age or COVID or or whatever. I'm not talking about any kind of violence, please. I always have to make sure you mention that in the crazy world in which we live right now. I'm not talking about that. There's God has ways of, of dealing with things. God has ways of destroying, of bringing things to naught. God has ways of exposing things. Um, but we can pray for their destruction. We don't want to think about that. But if we really want revival in our country, it might be that God has to totally destroy our country. Totally destroy the stock market. Totally destroy the things we're trusting. We're watching right now the educational system being destroyed. You talk about teachers and they'll talk about how kids are at home and supposed to be tuning in online and, and kids aren't doing that. We're going to have a whole bunch of kids now. Hey, when they graduate 18 years old, they'll be given a diploma just as a, hey, you participated. You signed in once a week or once a month or whatever. You did. But they're not educated. We're watching the destruction begin of our country. And it might have to be that our country gets destroyed before people will turn to God and look to God. But we got to pray for those authority. Let me give you a prayer request to pray for Pray for Chief, or not Chief Justice, but a Supreme Court Justice, Clarence Thomas. Pray for Clarence Thomas. He's the only African American on the Supreme Court. He's 72 years old. We need to pray that he can stay alive and stay active and all that for another four years. And maybe we can get a different president in there that would appoint another conservative Supreme Court Justice. I tell you, my fear is that we're going to hear of Supreme Court Justice Thomas dying in the next four years, kind of like what happened with Justice Scalia, and they found him with a pillow over his face, and then they said, oh, natural causes, and they cremated him before an autopsy. I'm afraid that same thing might happen to Clarence Thomas. We need to pray for the safety of Clarence Thomas. We, we have some evil, wicked people in our country that would think nothing of it, of taking him out, and then they can say, oh, he was old. It was natural causes. He had COVID, whatever it is. And then we need another Supreme Court justice. We need to pray for those that are in authority. We need to pray for them. Number three, what can we do in praying for our country? Number three, here's, this is not necessarily a prayer, but this is just what we need to do. We need to subject ourselves to laws that are not contrary to God's word. Subject ourselves to laws that are not contrary to God's word. They say, this is what you, okay. As long as it's not contrary to the word of God. And there's many verses on it. Let me give it to you right quick. I won't look at them for the sake of time. But in Matthew 22 and verse 21, Matthew 22, 21, that's where the Lord says, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar. Romans 13, 1 through 7, that's where it says, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. Romans 13, 1 through 7. Titus chapter 3 and verse 1, where Paul tells Titus to, teach people that they to be in subjection to kings. We're close right there. We can look at Titus chapter 3 and verse 1. He says, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, 
to obey magistrates and be ready to every good work. So this is a job of a pastor is to tell people to be subject to those in authority. And then the same in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 through 17, of where Peter talks about how that, let's go ahead and look at that right quick here. 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 says, Submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, and then he goes on to talk about more, but you can read all that later. Second Peter chapter two, verse 13 through 17. Submit yourselves to laws that are not contrary to the word of God. Let me give you the fourth one. What can we do? Number four, don't be part of the problem. Don't you <laughs> become part of the problem. I went to Bible college. Back that up again. I went to Bible college. I didn't say I went to a university. I went to a Bible college with other people, other young people that were at a, let me say that again, Bible college. And today, some of them are part of the problem. Some of them got into politics for the other side. They're against, they are taking an open stand against the word of God. And at one time they were in a Bible college. So I encourage you young people and even adults, don't change. Don't become part of the problem. Some that went to Bible college with today or that went to Bible college with back then today are teaching at different universities and they're teaching contrary to the word of God. They have become a part of the problem. <laughs> Don't you become a part of the problem. Don't you join in with the world and begin doing the things that they're doing. Don't you become on the part of the problem that's bringing the curse of God upon our country. Don't be part of the problem. Those that didn't show up to vote, they're part of the problem. I don't talk about those that were sick and couldn't or whatever. There's people who say, I don't get involved. Hey, you're part of the problem. That, that's why we have what's going on right now. Is there's people that just, just don't want to give up. Don't be part of the problem. Don't, don't, don't be, and I know there's so much more to say, but let me go on from there. And by the way, 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, come out from the world and be separate. If we'll come out, then that's when God will hear us and receive us. Don't be part of the problem. Turn to James. James chapter 4 and verse 3. Look at James chapter 4 and verse 3. Man, there's so much more that can be said on this, but I'm, I'm trying to wrap this up real quickly here. James chapter 4 and verse 3. The Bible says, Ye ask and receive not. Now listen, 70 plus million people pray are voted for Donald Trump. 70 plus. I've heard up to 75 million. I don't know what they know the number. They're probably still counting. They're probably still finding votes. Who knows what's going on there? 70 plus million. Now, do I think that all 70 million were praying? Probably not. What if half were praying? 35 million people. The Bible says you ask and receive not. 35 million people God said no to. You guys say, wait a minute, what's going on? Or maybe not half. What if 10%, 7 million people fasting and praying? There was all kinds of things going on for fasting and praying. I mean, what if there were 7 million people that wholeheartedly were seeking God's face and praying? I'd call that a remnant, wouldn't you? I mean, we read in the Bible about a remnant. I'd call that a remnant. If there were 7 million people that were that are truly righteous, God said he would spare Sodom and Gomorrah if he could just find 10 righteous. Imagine if there's 7 million righteous that were praying and seeking God's faith. And God said, no. Remember the heart of the king's in the hand of the Lord. The Supreme Court, good people, for whatever reason, just wouldn't even look at it. I think we can see God saying, blinding their eyes. Don't even look. We can see in all of these different states where there's all the, the problems. We can see that their state legislatures are Republican. Some of them even have Republican governors, and yet they were like, oh, I don't see anything. They had a blindfold on it. What? God just blinded their eyes. 
probably the most um, uh, honorable Christian man in all of government, Mike Pence. Even was like, huh? I don't see anything. Huh? God just blinded his eyes, and even Mike Pence just went along with him. I mean, you go on down the list of where there's people that just, no, I don't see anything. No, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. There's a saying that says all it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And we saw a whole lot of good men do nothing. Saw a whole lot of good Americans do nothing, not go vote. And then we saw a whole lot of good men just do nothing. And some of them, it's going to cost them political career. It's going to cost them their political career. Can you imagine Mike Pence trying to run? I mean, he might be able to run something local somewhere. People, that, But America's not going to take it. I, if Donald Trump does run in four years, I don't think he'll pick Mike Pence again. Good men to do nothing. That's what it takes. Uh, 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 God blinded. Something happened there. And God said, no. Look at this verse here again. Ye ask and receive not. Why? Because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Why were we really praying for America? Were we praying just because we wanted some more money? Were we praying just because we wanted? You fill in the blank. Why are we really praying for America? Why are we really concerned about our country? Think about this. How many of you today would be real willing to sell all that you have and move to the Philippines to have religious religious freedom. Now, I'm not promoting that a bit. I don't think this is a cult and I'm saying, okay, let's go. No, I'm not Jim Jones and saying, let's move. Okay, I'm just, I'm just throwing out a, a question. Would you be willing to sell all that you have and move to Mexico for religious freedom? Would you be willing to sell all that you have and move to Africa if, if there was a country where there's religious freedom? The reason why I say that is because that's what the pilgrims did. We celebrated 400 years. Them come, they sold everything, left everything to go to a place just for religious freedom. And in our country, the only reason people will move is because of money. They're in California or New York, and they realize, man, I don't know, financially, this is awful. The lockdowns and all that, and they're moving to Texas, and they're moving to Florida, they're moving places. Why can't there be Christians that say, I'm tired of being told I can't go to church. I'm moving to Texas where I can go to church. I'm tired of being told I can't go to church. I'm going to Oklahoma where I can go to church. I'm tired of being told I can't go to church. I'm going to Florida where I can go to church or whatever state. I, I, why can't people move for religious freedom? That's what the pilgrims did. They said, I'm going where there's religious freedom. And they came here and then we found our country. And by the way, that's another thing. The 1620, and I talked about it when we, were, when we looked at that at the 400th anniversary. That 1620, when that Mayflower Compact was signed, that was based upon biblical principles that their pastor that couldn't come because there was a lot of people that couldn't come, old age or maybe just people that didn't want to sell it all and move. And so their pastor had to stay behind over there, but he gave them some rules and some guidelines and things to go by in the new world. And they made a Mayflower Compact based upon that. And our world doesn't want that, so they're trying to go a year before, and they're calling it the 1619 Project, saying because there were people that came then that had slaves, and they're trying to say our country was founded upon slavery. Our country wasn't founded upon slavery. Our country was founded upon that Mayflower Compact. Yeah. 1620, it was founded upon biblical principles. Right. This is what's being taught to kids at school, being taught there is no God, being taught there's all evolution, being taught our country was founded upon uh, wrong principles. There's all these things being taught, being taught that you don't even know if you're a boy or a girl or not. You just wait and see. You ought to even experiment and try and see. You might like it better as, as opposite. All this is being taught, being, being encouraged. Being, we've got to get the message. That's why it's so good to have young people in church. They need to hear something alter, uh, alternative. These kids that don't go to church and they don't get to hear that, what else do you expect them to believe? No wonder 20-year-olds all vote a certain way. Not all of them, but I mean the majority. If that's the only world they've been exposed to, they go to churches where they don't hear the true, clear teaching of the Word of God, don't hear about creation, don't hear about these things, how else are they going to, they're going to have to then one day as they get older realize, wait a minute, I was lied to. And then that's when they will change. But we got to start early. We got to teach this generation. Let me, I got a couple of the verses I want us to look at here. Look down back to 1 Timothy 1. Turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. I am hurrying here. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20. Let me start at verse 19. 1 Timothy 1, 19, he says, Holding faith and a good conscience, with which 
some having put away concerning faith and made shipwreck, of whom whom is Hymenius and Alexander. Listen to this now, verse 20. 1 Timothy 1, 20. Whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So I said, we may have to turn our country over to Satan. We may have to turn our leaders over to Satan. Say, God, don't, don't put hold back. We may have to do that. So our country will quit learning to blaspheme. It will stop blaspheming. It's easy to pray that when it's talking about somebody else. But when it's your own child that's living in the world, it's hard to then say, okay, Lord, I'm turning them over to the devil. It's easy to say that about another country, but then when it's your own country, it's hard to go, yeah, okay, yeah, let's turn it over. <laughs> that was something that was done in the Bible. This is something that Paul taught and prayed about. Look at 1 Corinthians, same thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 4. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 4, he says, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 5, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. I'm saying we need to pray for our country, but I think we need to pray different than we've been praying before. I think it's different. We need to pray different. We need to think differently about our country. We need to get focused upon our heavenly country. We need to have more allegiance to God and the word of God than we do to red, white, and blue. I still love red, white, and blue. I'm still, you know, thankful that I'm American. I'm thankful for the freedoms that I have here. But I want to try to change my programming of my mind of rather than saying I'm proud to say I'm thankful. I'm thankful for this and I'm thankful for that. We've got to be careful of what we're saying I'm proud about because God's looking out from heaven and saying, you're proud about that? <laughs> you're proud about that? What would you say? I'm proud of my country for. What, what, what would you say? I'm proud of it. Oh, I'm proud of our past. Boy, look at, yeah, okay, that's good. I understand that. I'm proud of the past as well, but I'm looking at us right now. How do we pray for our country today? We can't pray for America 1776. We've got to pray for America 2021. How do we pray for a country? We be thankful for what we do have. And we need to follow the Bible. Again, don't listen to false prophets. Don't listen to even preachers. They're not false prophets, but they just lead you astray and begin thinking, well, revival's on its way. Revival's not on its way. Not until our churches change. Revival's not on its way until people start getting saved. Revival's not, don't, don't listen to people that are promised. Don't listen to your own ideas. Well, I don't care. I'm still going to be proud. Don't listen to your own ideas, your own dreams. Well, I don't care. I, I, just, I just believe this. Don't, don't listen to yourself. The heart is deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We've got to get to the word of God and see what God has to say. And then I challenge you to think about this as well. Has there ever been a Gentile nation that got away from God and then came back? ever been a Gentile nation? Just look back through history. We can read in the books of the Bible, Corinth. You know where Corinth is? They were a church. They were strong. They had a book of the Bible written to them. They got away from God. Where are they? Ephesus, Colossae, Thessalonica, Re uh, in Revelation, Laodicea, Philadelphia, not Pennsylvania, you look at it when a Gentile nation gets away from God. That's not good. Our country's been going away from God for a long, long time. And I think we finally have hit the iceberg. <laughs> and we can go back to sleep and pretend nothing's wrong. And we can jump in the lifeboats. We can start looking for the way out. We've got to realize we've hit the iceberg. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us, to help our country. Lord, please, there's so much you've laid on my heart. Lord, it, it so got my attention this past election. As we're praying and we're believing and everything appears like 
it's about to turn. The Supreme Court and the President and the Congress. And Lord, it looks so promising. But Lord, for some reason, you said no. Lord, help us to accept your will. Help us to believe that you're still in control. And Lord, help us to prepare ourselves for these end times. We talk about being in the end times, but help us to prepare ourselves and understand these end times. Lord, help us to be focused on getting people saved. Bless and help us. Help me. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. The altar is open.